welcome to Be Her Talk, everyone. This is an award-winning talk show that adds a taste of hip-hop, Asada Shakur, and spice to unflavored news. Each and every Sunday, we discuss race, politics, and culture from an unapologetic Black millennial perspective. And for the next several weeks, we've partnered with Black Enterprise as our official media sponsor as we unpack the 2020 election and its impact on the Black community. My name is Selena Hill, and I'm the digital editor at Black Enterprise and the founder of Be Heard Talk. And I'm super, super excited today because today our very special guest is Nina Turner. She is the national co-chair of the Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign. She's also done a lot in her remarkable and very impressive life. So we'll be speaking to Nina Turner a little later in the show. But for now, we have a very special guest correspondent with us. We have Nadia Stevens, who is the Deputy Chief of Staff to New York State Senator Jessica Ramos of Queens, New York. And she was also, uh, also Nadia, you worked with the Bernie campaign back in 2016. Remind us of your title back then. In 2016, I was the New York State Director for Senator Bernie Sanders. Impressive. And uh, okay, and now what are you what are you up to now these days? So I recently started working with Senator Ramos out in Queens, Jackson Heights, East Elmer's Corona. Um, she is a dynamic state senator, and I'm just honored to be her deputy chief of staff. And I'm excited to do incredible work together in Albany and throughout the state. And we're excited to have you. So thank you. And shout out to all of those who are watching us live via Black Enterprises, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter accounts, as well as Be Heard Talks Facebook accounts. Please leave the comments as we go. We will try to read and share as many as we have this very important conversation. I'm going to kick it back to Stanley, who's going to start off with the news roundup. And then we're going to talk to Nina Simone in a little bit. Stanley? Turner. <laughs> we'll play some Nina Simone later, Selena. So, oh, guys, did I say Nina Simone? <laughs> yeah. Nina Turner, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah. So, folks, this is the news roundup where we talk about things that made you laugh, cry, curse, flip a table, or put on some cash doll before you check to see if there were any edits. And we have a pretty big news for you folks today. But first things first, we got to talk about the biggest news story of the week, at least in Black communities, and the biggest news story to us, the verdict the, the grand jury verdict for the murder of Breonna Taylor came in and the grand jury didn't charge any officer with killing Ms. Taylor in her apartment. Instead, what they did was charge one cop for actually missing Breonna and shooting a bullet into a wall, which could have put her white neighbors at risk. You are hearing that correctly. And this verdict was done through a grand jury that was led by a black district attorney who also happens to be a staunch Republican and a staunch Trump supporter. Since this verdict has come out, there's been protests all over the place in New York, in Kentucky, in California, everywhere. Folks are frustrated. Folks really feel like there's been injustice. And now most recently, there's been more news coming out that makes people believe that the whole process of a grand jury was not on the level. For example, only one neighbor claimed they heard that the cops had announced themselves before they entered, but now we're finding out that that neighbor may have changed their story. So folks are asking even more questions. The protests are continuing. And I know, you know, we can talk all about the, the process of the law. We can talk about the district attorney. But before we do that, I just want to ask you two, how are you feeling after hearing this verdict? Selena? Yeah, I was on mute. Sorry about that. Um, upset, frustrated, tired. As upsetting as this verdict was, unfortunately, it's also unsurprising. Um, you know, this country and, and criminal justice system in particular has a long history of uh, oppression and not giving justice when it comes to black and brown bodies in this country, black and brown Americans. So Breonna Taylor to me was just a hit in the gut. Uh, but what I'm finding even more upsetting is the people in our own community who are not coming to this black woman, this slain black woman's rescue and, and, and defending her legacy. Um, one thing I found really upsetting was it was Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal who, you know, were doing a, a, their sports show and said that, you know, this case is nothing like Ahmaud Arbery or George Floyd and that, yes, it's unfortunate, but Kenneth Walker, who was Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, 
um, he, like she fired at the police and she just got caught up in the crossfire. And basically like, I just felt like the, the tone and the connotation behind it was just very negative and it was almost like victimizing. And I feel like people don't understand the facts of this case. First of all, um, like Stanley said, the one witness out of 12 who said that the police announced themselves months ago said that the police did not announce themselves when they showed up at Breonna Taylor's door around one o'clock in the morning while she was sleeping and in bed. Not only that, but Kenneth Walker has proven that he knew that he thought he was being, he was invaded and he called the cops and he, he fired off a, a, a firearm as a, a, as a, just a warning, a warning shot. And you know, this country is always preaching about second amendment rights, the right to defend your property and to defend your family. That is exactly what Kenneth Walker was doing. He was practicing and exercising his rights. But yeah. then again, it goes to show that when it comes to black and brown Americans, we don't have the same justices and we don't have the same rights. Yeah, no, 100% Selena. Nadia, um, what do you think about that? And I'd love to hear your reaction about what Shaq and Charles Barkley said saying that this is not like George Floyd? I, this is my first time hearing that. So my unedited reaction is that this is a typical response when the same thing that happens to a black man in this country happens to a black woman. And black men, unfortunately, even though black women are the first to rush to their defense, are the last to rush to ours. And it's just very painful and um, also not surprising, unfortunately. Um, I just wanted to point to the grand jury piece because America and Liberia are the only two countries in the world that still even use grand juries. Like England banned them 80 years ago because they realized that they were unfair and lend, did not lend themselves to transparency. Um, California abolished a grand jury in 2015. Grand juries indict um, less than 0.5%, sorry, they indict all the time, except for less than 0.5 of 1%. So they're always indicting, unless it's in a police killing. In the police killings, they always side with the police, or for the most part, they side with the police. And this is just for indictment. So I think that it's high time that we get rid of this racist um, and undemocratic form of government, um, this, this process that so many other countries have done away with. And I think we're very late. And I think it's very intentional that we still use the grand juries because it works for white supremacy in this country, unfortunately. Yeah, like, you know, as a justice said a long time ago, um, a district attorney could use a grand jury to indict a sandwich if they wanted to. If they, if they wanted to indict those officers, they absolutely could have. But what we're actually hearing is that the police department was pushing the district attorney to charge the cops with something so that they could say that they did do something about the case. And that's where this, this Walton um, endangerment came, in, came into play. You know, as somebody who, you know, I've been through enough of these to know what, when the writing is on the wall. So when this was going to grand jury, we knew what time it was, I knew what time it was. And it, it doesn't stop it from being hurt, hurtful or frustrating or challenging. And it's a shame that now like this man, this, this, this person, district attorney, who walked up there and said, I know how these families feel, I'm a black man. When he said that, I got nauseous. Because no, you're not. You don't stand with black people. You got black skin, but that's as far as it goes. You are actively selling out black communities so for white people. You are actively using your power to protect the police. He went and spoke at the, the Republican National Convention. This guy is as far away from black as it can get. Rachel Dolezal is blacker than this man. So I hope he keeps that same energy the first time his black son gets pulled over by the cops. That's mm. the way I feel about that. You know, folks are protesting all over the place. I know everyone is upset. I want to read Bianca's comment. She's saying at least canceled. Somebody on the grand jury got to leak something. She's not shocked. Uh, uh-oh, Stanley, we're having a little bit. Uh, can you read those comments from Bianca again? We're having a hard time hearing you. Sure. So um, Bianca says we need to release the transcript. Somebody on a jury, on a grand jury, to leak it. Okay, so Stanley's still having some technical difficulties, but Bianca did leave a comment in Zoom. She said, uh, release the transcript. Somebody on the jury gotta go. Something leaked. She also says that she is not shocked. I also wanted to read a comment from someone on, um, on Black Enterprises' Facebook page. Sylvia E. Gibson says, 
facts should ma matter. Where is the police body cams? And um, she also said, just evil. This was just evil. Thank you so much, guys. Keep those comments coming. Uh, and we will continue to contribute that to our conversations. Stanley, so, your, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Sorry about that, folks. So before we move on to the next story, I just want to make sure folks don't have any final thoughts on just the Breonna Taylor case and like things we should be doing next as people who support Black lives and want to protect Black women. Nadia? Um, I, I, I just wanted to point out that the, the just, I know I just keep railing against the, the grand juries, but it's just like they're, they're, so, they're such a big part of the problem that, you know, Daniel Cameron, he's not, um, he's, he's not a, a neutral party. He was Mitch McConnell's legal counsel for two years. You know what I mean? Like this guy and, you know, and aside from that, attorney generals just have relationships with the police. That, that is the, the way that the whole system works. So it's, it's just so corrupt and it's so rotten that we can't expect anything to change unless the systems and the processes change. So the people, the situations, you know, who is murdered, what black woman or man is murdered or, you know, Native American or Latino is killed. It, it's not going to change what actually happens. People will not get indicted as long as these systems stand. And so the first thing we have to do is break these systems apart because they are the culprit. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah so we got another comment on Facebook. Loretta, Loretta Anderson says, the proof is in his marriage. He is married to Mitch McConnell's granddaughter. Not no. only that. So yeah, no, I mean, the, hold on. I'm sorry. What'd you say, Nadia? That was debunked. It's not true. He's not his, his granddaughter. Oh, but Mitch McConnell was at his wedding though. Yes, he absolutely was. And I think that that's the reason that people thought that they were related. Yeah. Gotcha. He's not actually his granddaughter. Thank you, Nadia, for clarifying. But yeah, I, I think um, it's very clear that he has a bias and he has right-leaning ties and a, and a right-leaning agenda. President Trump has praised him. Um, like, as you said, he worked directly for Mitch McConnell. So we, what Kentucky needed was a special prosecutor. We didn't need someone who's so unexperienced and has clear biased ties to the Republican Party and a right-leaning agenda to come into this case. What we needed was justice. Well, that's and who the folks voted for, though, Selena. Like, they, they voted for him to be Attorney, district attorney. Well, but I'm saying, can't someone, couldn't the governor come in and say we're going to assign a special prosecutor? I mean, he should have. He absolutely should have, and that's a larger problem. But like, that's like, I don't mean to be that guy, but like this, this pretty much non kinfolk person is a reason why like folks should really be, be, be paying attention to local elections because there's no reason he should have ever been elected. We knew, like, we knew he was an Uncle Tom when he was in the race. It was being covered in national news. So like, what did you expect to happen when he got there? So we really have to be vigilant. And I'm not telling people that like voters are gonna save your life, it absolutely is not. But we can't just have folks like that walking into office because there's no competition. Agreed. I, I mean, I think also that I 100% agree. I thought like, okay, this is Kentucky. Like we have to think about like the state that this is happening in yeah. and they obviously have the most right leaning everything, legislature, yeah. attorney general, Mitch McConnell's there. You know what I mean? It's just, if, if this was going to happen anywhere, it was going to happen in Kentucky. I mean, but regardless, this does happen all over the country because of, you know, because of the way that how broken the system is, but absolutely in Kentucky, if you, if you were going to take a bet, you know, you would bet that this would happen here, unfortunately. Yeah. And just for some more clarification on Daniel, the, um, the, the DA. Um, so what Bianca posted in our chat for us is that he is Mitch McConnell's protege. He earned a, a scholarship to Louisville um, from Mitch McConnell. And that's how the relationship started. And obviously, as Nadia mentioned, he worked in Mitch McConnell's office as his, I think, general counsel or lead counsel. And then went back to Louisville so that he can continue to push the right agenda, um, but do it with police and the legal system. So folks, I, I do want to um, move us away from this a little bit, but keep it in a legal system. So as you know, last week, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. And of course, before her body could get cold, the Republican Party committed to voting in a new Supreme Court justice. And on Saturday, Donald Trump picked who that person is going to be. Her name is Amy Coney Barrett. And she is a long-term teacher, an appeals court judge, and a mother of seven children. She has voted in and other decisions that 
we should be able to deport people um, who come into this country and are Muslim. She has also said that police should have the right to shoot people and not be penalized. And she is an adamant supporter of repealing Roe versus Wade, AKA the 13th Amendment for white women. She gave a speech on Saturday. The New York Times, as usual, gave a horrible analysis of it saying that she was the conservative feminist. There's no such thing as conservative feminism. Feminism is just like intrinsically lefty and against conservative standards, but I digress. And now it looks like they're gonna try and fast track her right into the Supreme Court. What do you, how are you guys feeling about this, Nadia? Um, it's, it's terrifying. I think that um, it's, um, Amy Coney Barrett is, she, she believes that women should be subservient to their husbands. Um, this is a woman who is a member of a group called People of Praise, which like pools their money together so that they can, um, it's sort of like this strange like sisterhood and brotherhood and like the men are a part of the group too and they commit 10% of their money to, uh, to this group um, that con combines con Catholicism a and- So a cult. <laughs> it's a cult. It's 100% a cult. And um, she's 48 years old, so she's very young. And if she is appointed, she will be in this position for at least like two generations, um, given life expectancy in America. So it's, it's terrifying. And I think that Mitch McConnell, uh, not Mitch McConnell, um, Chuck Schumer as a minority leader, he needs to use every trick in the book to get this, to stall this from happening because it takes 50 to 70 days to appoint, to go through the process of appointing a Supreme Court justice. So with only like 34 days or so, I'm not really about 34 days until the election, um, this does not need to happen. Like we, we can do something to stop this from happening, but it can't just be on the American people. The people who we elected to office need to stand up for us and need to have a spinal cord and to, um, to stop this from happening. Selena, what do you think about this choice? First of all, Amy Coney Barrett is polar opposite of who Ruth Bader Ginsburg was and everything she stood for. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a legal, cultural, and feminist icon, as well as the architect of the legal fight for women's rights in the 70s. Not only did she change the world for women, but she opened the door that has allowed Amy Barrett to actually become and be nominated as a Supreme Court justice. And it's a shame that as part of Amy, Amy's legacy, more than likely she will overturn those same freedoms that Ruth Bader Ginsburg fought for. That's number one. Number two, you mentioned Roe versus Wade, but that's not the only thing that's in jeopardy. The Supreme Court is also set to consider a challenge to the Affordable Care Act, AKA Obamacare, immediately after the election. And if she has made it very clear that she is in favor to rule for the Trump administration, which is suing, which has a lawsuit out to abolish Obamacare. In effect, this would eliminate 130 million people's health care during a health pandemic. My question is, I don't understand. With facts like this, I don't understand how the Republican Party continues to put these blinders on the eyes of American people. This is, this is your leader. This is your king. This is what he's fighting for, to eliminate health care in a pandemic. Like, just... The this is what they want. That are horrible. Like, I don't, I, I really don't understand that. And I did want to just add to, because you were talking about Amy Coney Barrett and her family life. President Trump also touted her as being a mother and a wife during the speech. And I'm like, why is that a credential? Like, she, ha she didn't accomplish anything else. Like, look, I, I, I love, you know, women, obviously we can be strong, we can be mothers. But I, I just felt, first of all, she's not the only person to uh, uh to sit she's not the only person that would sit on the supreme court that's a parent okay yeah. there's other people that were parents there like you i'm just not impressed i'll put no, it like no. this she doesn't well, like, impress me let's give some respect to the mothers out there because being a parent is an important job but for someone who has been practicing law for at least 20 plus years of their lives you that's would think that you wouldn't need to mention that they have kids when talking about their qualifications i want to um just um bump up a question that's being asked in the facebook chat on black enterprises page from Donna Jackson, shout out to Donna for asking. She goes, if, pardon me, slow. If she's not approved prior to the election, what happens then? Will the new administration get to choose a candidate? Well, Donna, if she's not approved before the election, they may try to approve her during the lame duck session. 
which I don't think that's happened before, or at least recently. But I wouldn't put it past the Republicans to try to push a lot of things through during the lame duck session, especially if they lose their seats. Because it's not just a presidential election we're facing right now. We also have congressional elections, and a lot of Republican senators are up for re-election, and their races are not looking good. So what they might tr decide to do is just use that lame duck session between like November and January before the new crop of people come in to push through a bunch of laws, bills that people won't notice because who's paying attention at that moment? So that's, that's the likelihood of that, of that happening. Um, and if they did that, do you think there's a way that we can stop that, Nadia? Um, it's, it's very difficult. It would be very difficult for us to stop it because we don't have control of the Senate. Um, but I think that just there's one thing that I think that we need to also pay very close attention to. The reason that Trump is making this like his number one thing to do right now, even though there's an election happening, people are voting already, and there's a pandemic taking place. Um, Trump is going to contest the election. If he loses, he's going to contest the election and it will end up in the Supreme Court. So it's very important to him that he has a, a, a super majority on the Supreme Court to make sure that they rule in favor of him. So he wants as many appointees as he can so that he can steal democracy again. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, this is the situation that we're in. It's well, terrifying. Welcome, welcome to the end game. So this is the march towards fascism. This is it right here. Yeah, it definitely is. It's, I mean, listen, we talked about this for years. And I'll say, yes, since 2016, we talked about this possibly happening. And now we're in this space where it could be. But to just to step away from Trump a little bit, but focus on someone who also has small hands, too big of an ego, and slanderous behavior, let's talk about the rapper Tory Lanez. So, as many of you know, Tory Lanez actually, someone said Paul George, not Paul George, Tory Lanez has been accused of shooting Meg Thee Stallion in the back of the foot. Meg Thee Stallion said that, it was, that he was the one that did it. Um, some other folks who have been there said that he was the one that had the gun. And Tory Lanez apparently sent Meg Thee Stallion a text message apologizing for shooting her, saying that he was drunk. He had been pretty silent while all these rumors were flying around. But then on Thursday evening, he said that he was going to go on Instagram Live to defend himself. He said he would go at 9 p.m. At 9 p.m., a day after the Breonna Taylor non-indictment came out, Tory Lanez didn't go on IG Live. Instead, he announced he was putting out an album to clear his name. Selena, have you listened to the album? Will you? First of all, I don't want to stream the album. I did stream the song Money Over, what was, it was Money, Fall Out Over Money or something. The song where he directly addresses the, the incident, I did listen to the song as well as read the lyrics just for context because uh, I knew we were talking about it. Um, first, it's extremely problematic. Like, not only is he lying and, and debating the facts of the matter. First of all, Megan Thee Stallion, she, she, had, she made a police report, and there's medical records that she was shot in the foot and that it was found in her heel. So he's debating that. He's also debating the record of his height. He was like, I'm not 5'3", I'm 5'7". And we're like, Tori, this is all on record. <laughs> Why does he think he can debate facts? I think Tor Tory needs to, he needs to join the Republican Party where they live yeah. in this fallacy and they make things up. That's where he needs to live and he needs to go. He's debating his height? Yes, the, in the song. He was like, oh, y'all trying to say I'm 5'3". I'm really 5'7". Oh my God, no one cares. No one could care less, Tory. Nadia, what are you, are you going to listen to the 5'7 Poppies album? Of course not. I did not. I, I like read a couple articles about it. I just... It's, it's just, um, it's tone deaf of him to come out um, disrespecting black women right after, like right while they're, we're having this conversation about the United States disrespecting black women and for him to come out and say that she was lying. Um, like we didn't see, like, you know, like we weren't watching this like unfold as it happened. It's in, like Selena said, it's very, it's, it's Trumpish to just say that things that didn't happen, that did happen, didn't happen. It's like, we were there, you know, we have the internet. Why do they think we don't? Yeah. Listen, this is the last time we'll talk about Tory Lanez on this show. We will not play his music on this show. I will not listen to that album. If we were in the pre-streaming days, we would call that album a weed plate because that's, that's the only thing it's good for. Support Meg Thee Stallion, support Black women, and stop giving abusive people, but particularly abusive men, a platform. They don't deserve one at all. With that being said, I want to just switch it over to my girl Selena so we can get going to the main event. Thank you so much, Stanley. And yes, 
uh, great conversations, but we do want to just switch gears to talk about the main topic. And that is the fact that the election is just weeks away. But progressives and some young Black Americans are not sold on Joe Biden, the Democratic Party, or voting at all. So for the next 30 minutes, we'll discuss whether or not the establishment can reach the far left by November. According to a recent report by CNN, many young criminal justice activists are not enthusiastic about casting their ballots for the Democratic presidential ticket because they feel Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are not attuned to their perspective and are untrustworthy due to their track records on criminal justice. As we know, Biden wrote the 1994 crime bill, which is often cited as a driver of mass incarceration, particularly because of the three strikes law that ensued mandatory life terms for defendants with at least three federal violent crime or drug convictions. Meanwhile, Kamala is a former prosecutor. So a survey conducted by American University of African Americans in battleground states reveals that Biden has only locked down voters 40 and over when it comes to the black voters, the black community. And of that, 47% of black folks under the age of 30 plan to plan, do not plan to vote for the Democratic presidential nominee. Instead, they may very well sit things out in November as many of them did back in 2016. About half of the respondents on this survey under 30 say they don't often vote because, and I quote, it doesn't make a difference. So joining us in this conversation, we have Nina Turner, the national co-chair of the Bernie Sanders 2020 presidential campaign and former Ohio State Senator. Nina also recently launched a mayor public affairs which is a new firm designed to advance the progressive ideals and issues. Thank you so much, Nina, for being here with us today. How's it going? Very well, thanks for having me. So Nina, some progressives on the far left say they will not vote for Biden, even if it means a Trump victory, largely because he has failed to adopt a progressive agenda on healthcare, mass incarceration, the environment, and policing. Is Joe Biden doing enough to court progressives and diehard Bernie supporters? He can do more. I mean, we, we understand, and I'm glad I had a chance to listen to a little bit of what you, you and Nadia and Stanley were talking about a little earlier. You know, this is a battle between neo-fascism and neoliberalism. That is how progressives see it, or people who are more on the liberator side of the scale. I know sometimes when we use the term progressive, that might not necessarily be the love language for African-American people in particular. I think the whole notion of liberation, having liberation economically, politically, socially, environmentally. So it's the candidate's job, Selena, it's the candidate's job to speak the love language of the people who you are trying to attract and not the other way around. And one of the things that troubles me about this particular environment, especially those neoliberal types or moderate Democrats is they want to browbeat. I mean, the statistics that you just laid out about young African-Americans, I would argue young people across the board, we know who they were rocking with. They were rocking with Senator Bernie Sanders. That was very clear. It was clear in 2016. It was clear in 2020. And it was about authenticity. It wasn't about who can hype the most. Who can, No, it was about what do you stand for. And the millennial generation, I have a millennial son, and the, G, and, and the Zs, mm -hmm. your generation tends to lean towards not so much a party affiliation, mm -hmm. but what are you standing for? Do you have a, a vision that will provide provision for the people? And that is the, the way that the country is going. So with 40, 40 days, 39 days left, they have some more work to do. If I were the Biden campaign, I would be very concerned about these numbers because we don't want anybody to sit out. I, I want people to go to polls mad as hell. Even if they mad, I still want them to go. Go vote. But there is some truth to I vote for this person or that person on all levels of government. And really, what have they done? Where is the material change? Where is the change in my material conditions? I think that's a fair question to ask. It absolutely is a fair question, Nina. And you know, you spoke about love language. Now, the first presidential debate is happening in your state, Ohio, in a my few city. days, in your city. Uh, what, what language, what vocabulary, what is it that progressives need to hear from Joe Biden 
to rally them up and get them enthusiastic about going to the polls? Listen, I would say it's not just about progressives. You know, one thing you guys were talking about is the dangers of the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and what is at stake. And you talk very clearly about the Affordable Care Act up again, up, up back, back against the wall on that. And how could the Republicans stand for something in the midst of a pandemic? I lay that argument at the feet of every elected official because what the pandemic did was just reveal where we already were. This is no surprise. There've been plenty of folks, particularly poor folks. And if we drill down even deeper than that, African-American folks who have been living in a pandemic-like situation the entire time. But now this global pandemic has not allowed anybody, if they, if they care, not to have blinders on. And so we need Medicare for all. Why should healthcare be commodified in the United States of America? I use that as my primary example because that is not a left or right issue. It's an issue for humanity. And with over 90, what about 92 people, 92 million people in this country, either underinsured or uninsured, 50 million and counting people have lost their jobs. Many of those people, their health care was attached to those jobs. We have to begin to question what is the role of government and what do the people who we elect to office owe the everyday people of this country, the poor, the working poor, and the barely middle class and not just the people who, who have it all already. Stanley, um, I think Stanley's trying to talk, but we can't hear you. Can you repeat that? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Perfect, perfect. So Queen Nina, you know, one of the things Oh my God, Stanley, repeat it again. You're going in and out. I don't is your hand on the mic? No, I don't think so. So can you hear me now? He can. Oh no, Stanley, we lost you again. <laughs> Try it again. Queen Nina, can you? It, it go, it's, go, it's going in and out. When you first start, I can hear you, and then it fades. All right, well, let's, let's skip. Oh, it's working. Yeah, you're good. Quick before the FBI stops my internet. So one of the things folks aren't excited about is Biden and Kamala's criminal justice platform. What, like, what should we be demanding? What could we expect from a Biden-Kamala administration if a Breonna Taylor happened there? Listen, the vice president has said that he wants to give even more money to the, to the police force. We have to make the demand. And so laying out a clear vision for what policing should look like in the United States of America, period. And you know, Stanley, and I'm saying this as a mother, my son is in law enforcement. My husband is a retired police officer. So I get this issue on all sides, you know, having my two black men racially profiled as black men in America and also having them wear that badge and carry that gun and taking that oath to protect and serve. So one thing in particular is expunging records of African-American people and other people who went down on drug charges, particularly marijuana. Let's go on and legalize cannabis. Don't play with it. Just, just go ahead and do it and make sure as this nation continues to legalize it state by state, even though the feds won't take it off of schedule one, that the, on the economic side, so there's a criminal justice side to de-incarcerate, that's that side, expungement of records, but there's also an economic side to cannabis too. Who is going to own the majority of those businesses or have shares in the businesses that now most, most of the people who own those uh, businesses in, in, in states where it is legal are white men. So black men and women went down on the charge, but yet white business owners get to reap the benefits in states where, they, where, where it is legal. And so the federal government has to take a position, not just on the criminal justice side, but also on the economic side too. And you have people like Michael Rinder, AKA Killer Mike, who has been talking a lot about how the government, the federal government and state government, federal government in particular, can ensure that on the economic side, black folks reap some benefits from that. Yeah, that's just one aspect. You got to undo. It's okay for people to evolve. You know, who among us haven't been wrong about some issue or times change and you change with the times. But so far, Vice President Biden has not shown clearly that he has evolved on these issues enough to, to stake, to be very clear about it. I was wrong. 
I made a mistake or I see it differently. Or if I had it to do all over again, I would have done it a different way. You don't hear that kind of repentance, if you will, and then to provide a vision moving forward. So we got to continue to make the demand. I would say whoever wins this election and God knows President Donald J. Trump needs to go. I am not doing cartwheels about the other choice, but neo-fascism is dangerous. However, we cannot fall so in love with politicians, no matter if they look like us or they don't, that we don't demand and then also hold people accountable. And if they don't do what they promised the people, they got to go. Plain and simple. It's just as easy as that. Absolutely. Nadia, I know you had a question for Nina. I do. Senator, thank you so much for just being you. I met you in 2016 when I was the state director for Bernie Sanders and you you did our Brooklyn launch and you were brilliant then. You continue to be brilliant. Thank, thank you. Thank you for my, reminding me of that, Nadia. And thank you for being in the trenches with us in 2016. You know from an insider's perspective how hard we were working to elevate those values. Absolutely. And you just laid them out again just now. And I wonder if there's everything you said about everything from de-incarceration to marijuana legalization. We know that, is there any way that we can get the Biden administration to create a platform or to move him left to do any of this? Do you think that there's any possible way, there's anything that we can do as a people between now and November? I know that's- I'm, I'm hesitating here. Um, now in November, I'm not so sure. I mean, what else needs to be said? What else do Black lives have to do and, and, and our allies and co-conspirators have to show that we need a true change. I mean, a lot of activists, Nadia, in this space, you, as you know, have been very clear. The system is working as it was designed to work. This, this is it. And so we might not want to admit that as a nation. It's hard for this nation to admit that racism and bigotry and white supremacy and anti-Blackness, plain and simple, is in the DNA of the United States of America. Now that doesn't mean it has to be forever, but unless we put forth a effort on all levels of government to eradicate, to ameliorate, we will still be here. So let me back up. I think there's always a way. And so I thank the activists that are in the street. We need some people in the street. We need some people in the meeting room. We need somebody, some people behind the scenes. We need some people running for office because it is all of that energy that builds the synergy to make the change. So let's make the demand. Now, they win and they don't honor the demand, then we know where we stand. That's it. And that's all. So I would say, let's keep pushing with the days that are left. They win make that demand and don't play with it. I mean, the yeah. day after the election, yeah. we should be in the streets, no yeah. honeymoon, no waiting. And right. then don't allow them to make any excuses as to why they can't get it done. No, no excuses. Thank you, Senator. And I think it's important to note that the activism doesn't end, like what you just said, the activism does not end on election day. It keeps going. That's when the real fight begins to get That's what we've done. So Absolutely. we're getting some comments in. Sylvia E. Gibson says on Facebook, until our people, Black people, can come together with their platform, they will not be able to make any kind of demand. Um, and Darren Mack left a comment in our Zoom chat. He says, he, I think he's wanting reparations for the war on drugs, which was a war on Black people. Uh, ending mass incarceration is going to take mass investments and impact in impacted communities, we are still feeling the impacts of the crime bill, uh, thanks to Joe. Thank you guys for those comments. Mm. Keep them coming. But you know, Nina, that kind of leads me into my next point because I do feel like a lot of us who were either supporting, you know, Bernie, whether we call ourselves leftists, progressives, or people fighting for liberation, sure. um, we don't, we're not feeling as aligned and represented by the Biden Kamala ticket. And I feel like there's a lot of this infighting within the Democratic Party. There's a lot of divide. And I'm not hearing enough of my friends on the far left who, are, who lean further left than I do say that they're going to come to the polls. Is there any way we can bridge this divide? And I know you're saying it, it falls on the candidate. But then, you know, my second point is if Biden says something that's too far, far left, he's going to be deemed as a socialist. And he might alienate those white moderates in, in, in in the middle of the country. But Sister Selena, he's already been labeled that. The Republicans are already using that. Just look at some of their, their commercials, both the commercials that are playing on TV and also on radio and, and social media platforms. They're already calling him a socialist. 
So this is a, not about, and let me, t if, 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 if we got folks in this country, and obviously we do, because President Trump can't pull up what wasn't already there. Can I just park that there right now? Right, right. Can we stay in the parking lot on that one? Trump is a, a neo-fascist, no doubt about it. But we also, what is even more concerning to me, and he is concerning to me, is the fact that we have folks in this country who are motivated by that. That means that it was there all along. That's something else we want to, don't want to face. That it was there before he got there. It will be there after he leaves, unless we do something about it. Now, look, we don't need a president stoking it and raising it up and allowing it to come on out into the light. But we got overt racism and bigotry, and we got covert racism and bigotry that has been there since day zero, as one of my elders said. The foundation, the founding of this country, and we all get that. So, Selena, to answer your question directly, People are going to have, to, we, 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 a choice is going to have to be made. A decision is going to have to be made. And I know that people are mad and I know that they are frustrated. And what they need is leaders, elected leaders, former elected leaders, leaders from all walks of life to acknowledge the pain. Mm -hmm. It does no good to pretend like everything is okay, that it was okay before Trump got, listen, black folks lost 40% of their wealth in their housing during the Great Recession. Hello, somebody. 40%. It wasn't a beautiful thing before this man took office. The water in Flint, dirty mm. as hell, poisoned people before this man took the oath of office. But we turned a blind eye. Hello, somebody. So we do need validate, not validators for any campaign, but I'm talking about validators for humanity to stand up and say, we got to get out there and we have to vote, period. We have to. Now people have choices. We know that in 2016, what the majority of vo eligible voters said, I'm just, I'm not coming out. I'm not gonna do it. We cannot have that happen again. Now I'm not in the vote shaming. I'll leave that to the professionals. Cause I don't think you win people over by demanding that grown folks without showing that you're gonna stand up and change their material conditions. That's really all. Bernie Kratz, the liberators, are asking for. Say when you ask me about criminal justice reform or Nadia talks about that, you're not asking an unreasonable question. You're just saying, look, sister or brother, I give you my power. What you going to do with it? What are you going to do for the poor? What are you going to do for the working poor? What are you going to do for the, for the barely middle class? What are you going to do for black folks? That is a fair question to ask. That's a very fair question to ask. So... Um, my question for you is, you just talked about something that's very real. These racists was here before Trump. All he did was give them somebody that they can get hype for. The way we get hype for Beyonce and yeah. Rihanna, Trump is their Rihanna. They're hype for him. When, if and when he leaves, and he will leave eventually, that feeling will not go away. And I know personally, I've had a, a much harder time having empathy and wanting to hold space for white folks. How do we, what kind of work do we need to do to bridge that, that gap, because at least it's my belief that we can't topple white supremacy without white people being engaged in it and that's wanting to do it as well. So what do we have to do? That's it, Sam. We need truth and reconciliation. I mean, as bad as South Africa is and still our black Africana sisters and brothers are not economically free, politically as free. I mean, apartheid is gone, but we know that system still exists that created apartheid and that created the haves and the have not. And unfortunately, the majority of Black Africanas is in the have not, just like we are here in the United States of America. So we do need true truth and reconciliation. They did at least do that. They called the question and people got a chance to come and lay bare the pain we don't address that in the United States of America. People talk about the, we use a whole lot of platitudes, all men are created equal and are doubt by their creator with certain inalienable rights among those life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But we leave out the fact that when those words were written as beautiful and magnificent as they are, a whole bunch of folks left out. Black folks were enslaved at the time. And it wasn't that so much of a pursuit, because hell, if it was a real pursuit, they would have freed our ancestors right then and there. So. James Baldwin once said, know from whence you came. If you know from whence you came, there's virtually nowhere that you cannot go. So it is appropriate, Stanley, for us to talk about the past so that we can understand the path for liberation moving forward. Long way for me to say that this nation, this country has to atone 
for its sin, has to atone for its immorality, period. And that atonement can't just be in words, it has to be in deed. This nation would not be the hegemon nation that it is today without black bodies, mm. black labor, black tears, black blood. Baby, that's it and that's all. And so we need our white sisters and brothers to understand that when we talk about that, that's not a, an attack against them. It's an attack against a system that was allowed to permeate for generations and generations. And that white skin privilege does exist in the United States of America. And just as it was done on purpose, we need this to be undone on purpose. And yes, we need conscious minded white sisters and brothers to join us in this fight for true liberation and equality for black folks. And once black folks get it, hell, everybody gets it. We know that. Look at all the great movements in this country. They all take a page from the black liberation movement, baby. That's it. Yeah, we need them. We need all, all of them, Stanley. Every single one from the boardroom to the, to, to the, to, to the streets, all of them. Uh, Nina, before we get to Nadia's question, we're getting so many comments on our Facebook, and you preached a good word on this Sunday. I just want to say that Sylvia says, "Speak truth, demand true justice, demand reconciliation." Um, Nissy Baylor said, "It's very hard to leave. People are wanting and waiting. What to do? Who's going to start it?" Uh, someone called Tommy called Trump a worm and an apple, and. Mike Teeple says, what if we organize protests in the streets now demanding commitments to these policies or else they don't get our vote? And to me, that kind of is a little reminiscent to what Diddy, Pete Diddy and Ice Cube were talking about. It was kind of a, you know, our vote either you adopt, yeah, adopt a black agenda yeah. or we're not showing up. I, I was very vocal against that type of that, that type of thinking. But what do you what do you say to that? Listen, I, they're, they're making a point here. It's an awakening. It is, it's a shock. What both Diddy and Q is mm -hmm. saying to Black America, but they're also saying to all of America that we can't continue along this path. How many generations, how many elections are we going to give where Black people really get nothing at all? So I understand exactly what they're saying. I wouldn't say, and I don't think they're saying that Black people don't vote, but they're, they're, it's an awakening that has to happen. Black people are not homogeneous, and, and, we, and we know this. We, we think different ways at different times. The stats that you laid out, Selena, we got our younger African-American voters saying, hey, we're we not excited, we're not moved, and this is why we're not moved. Not an affiliation to a party, but I want to see some receipt. What are you going to do? I, that's, I want to see it, I want to hear it, I want to feel it, I want to touch it. You got to tell me something before I get you, give you the vote. And then we have our older voters who have just already said, I am going to vote for... Mr. Biden and Senator Harris. And so there's a clash of generations somewhat. I think, and I don't know if Nadia saw some of this in 2016, but I will tell you, not all elders are in that category. And I'm not knocking, I don't want anybody to say, because I, I, listen, black elders, power, I get it. But there are some seasoned folks who tired of it too, because they want to see their children and their grandchildren be able to live a good life, period. And so they over it as well. I, I can't tell you how surprising it was on the campaign trail in both 16 and 20 to have older voters say, we're tired of being taken, taken for granted. So what, what Diddy and Ice Cube had to say has a space in this fight that we are engaging in, in the African-American community. We need all of those views to make the whole. We need all of that energy to make the whole. Senator. Um, I, I, as you said, we, I was with you in 2016 and I did, I did see that they were the minority cause it was mostly like young people, but there are a lot of elderly people who realize that, you know, that they were being taken advantage of and that their vote was just expected of them and they wanted something more. Yes, um, so thank you for speaking to that. I did want to ask, so I think that it's, it's scary to assume or it's it's not smart to assume that trump is going to lose because it's the same thing we assumed last time and so we have to um we have to keep that in mind but if he does lose you know god willing <laughs> um and he decides not to leave voluntarily as he has said many times 
what happens then? Do you have any idea or any suggestions on anything that can be done? Because he has said that he plans to serve another four years and another four years after that. So what do we do in that? I mean, he's definitely a tyrant and dictator, as Dr. Cornell West calls him, a, a, the gangster in the White House. And, and that's, that's true. And it's, it's a bad, it's, it's really bad. Um, we have to be ready for that. One thing that we do know about the United States of America, the peaceful transfer of power has been very much a part of, of, of the American transition, period. And you have a man who's already saying up front that he's about to buck the Constitution. It's the same Constitution that many of his supporters always try to throw up in our face time and time again. But when it comes to this, I'm not hearing much. The, the Congress, and I don't know from a legal standpoint, and that would be good for you guys to get a legal expert to talk about that because that's a very good question. So I'm not going to pretend to be somebody I'm not. I don't know from a legal standpoint um, what the procedures are. What I do know is that in the United States of America, this is not the way that it goes. And President Trump is going to lead. Now, he can talk that talk all he wants to right now, but he's, he is going to have to leave that White House. Procedurally, I don't know if the Congress, what the Congress's authority is to, 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 to make him leave and whether or not they have any authority, but hopefully people are looking at that right now. I think we, the people, have to continue to rise up as we always have risen up, because whether you like Trump or not like Trump, what he is talking about doing, if a Democrat was in there, I mean, imagine if President Obama just said, you know, look, I ain't leaving. I'm staying right here. Like I was hoping he would do right, it. Right, right. <laughs> Some people were hoping that he would do that. You know, that, that wouldn't fly. That's wrong. Right. So President Trump knows that he's wrong and that he cannot do that. And so we just got to be ready, all the tools in our arsenal ready to make sure that he leaves that office. Yes, ma'am. It doesn't belong to him. It's the people's office. Mm -hmm. It's not his. Yeah, absolutely right. And thank you so much for that, Nina. As we start to bring this conversation to a close, I want to do spend some time on solutions, right? Uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that, about next step solutions so that we can continue to push the Black agenda no matter who is in office, because we know it's not... It didn't, this, these issues didn't start with one president and they're not going to be solved with one president. So not only that, but you have a new public affairs firm that also seeks to address these issues and provide solutions. So what is it, what are, what are some of the solutions here? You know, for me, Amare is about amplifying, representing the, poli the, the progressive voice in all aspects of American society, society, period. We need progressives or liberators need to be in every single space. You know, one example that I will give is that we know that there are a lot of black colleges and universities where students, even in the face of this pandemic, did not have the necessary internet connections, for example, to be able to learn and keep up with their homework remotely. One of the things that I am hoping to push some of these corporations that have put out all that money, they say it won't help racial justice. One good example of that is using some of that money that has been pledged to ensure that the over 100 black colleges and universities have the broadband that students need to be able to keep up with their studies and do their work away from the institution itself. And then we know that broadband itself is a challenge. In infrastructure is a challenge in the United States of America for, for a lot of poor people. You know, I've traveled rural areas. That's, that's one solution. The other is on the, on the economic side. We know that generational wealth is a problem. And I will tell you, Selena, Nadia, and Stanley, that is something that gnaws at my heart. You know, I'm the oldest of seven children. And my mother died when she was 42 years old dreams deferred, worked really hard, just died, you know, was not expected to die. And she didn't have an insurance policy. She didn't have anything for seven children. I'm the oldest, 22 years old. The youngest child is 12 and there's seven of us. Mm. So there's something about trying to help our community build generational wealth. That is something that must be answered and it must be answered immediately that black people have enough to pass on to their children and their children's children and that's not just gonna happen through working a job we got to own some stuff and that is one of the reasons another reason why i have delved into this because i want to use that skill set that i have on the on the political side to begin to meld what i stand for in that value proposition in the 
public sector as well on the or excuse me on the private side as well and really be a shepherd to pushing these companies and also government to do more to plant the seeds that are cultivated so that black people can have an inheritance to enjoy in their life and then to leave to their babies it is something immoral about the economic condition that we find ourselves in, no matter how hard we work in the United States of America, still in mass. There's some of us who get over, moving on up. I know I'm dating myself, the Jeffersons, but it's hard. And some of us never make it on up, even if we work every day of our lives. I know that's right. Um, Stanley, we're talking about solutions. What, what steps do you think need to be made so that again, you know, the black agenda is something that is represented, our interests are represented at the polls and moving forward. So we need more, we need to be listening to more black led, black run organizations. There is a black agenda, but the black agenda is multifaceted because not all black people have the same politics. So instead of just censoring the one black leader for the last 40 years, start looking, start looking for some of these newer leaders, start listening to some of these younger folks, start listening to folks who don't, don't support respectability politics and stop listening to white men politicians who went to one church and kissed one black baby and think they know the black struggle. You do that, you might be in better shape. Oh, Stanley, ooh. Um, so Lena, let me jump in. Our Black Party is a new, you talk about young people. Mm -hmm. If you guys go to ourblackparty.org, this is an organization that was just created this year. Uh, certainly, uh, Pub Daddy is supporting this organization. I'm supporting this organization started by young, African-American leaders, both yep. elected and non-elected. It's called Our Black Party. If you go to ourblackparty.org, that's one example of a solution. Help them young people push a, po a portion of the Black agenda. Because, Stan, you're absolutely right. It, the Black agenda is multifaceted, not just one agenda. Nadia, what are your final thoughts on a solution? Uh, it was somewhere in line with what both Stanley and what Nina was saying is that we need a we need a pipeline for young black leaders because there are a lot of like young there's like a lot of brilliance in the in young black people and we need to bring it to the fore and so I think that I'm going to check out our blackparty.org as soon as we get off this call because I want to see what that's all about it sounds like exactly what we need. It definitely is. So I do want to just thank you so much, Nina, for your time, your insight, your expertise, and just your, your dedication to the fight. Um, we appreciate it. And I just want to leave everyone with this. Again, voting is only the first step. It's only one step in the fight for true liberation. It's going to take us putting our foots on their necks now until the end of time. Look, people who are in power because of white supremacy and the, the way that this system is structured, they're not giving it up anytime soon. But that's why we have to remain consistent and dedicated and not get distracted. We have to continue to organize, galvanize, and make sure that our voices are heard by any means necessary. And on that note, I want to thank everyone who watched our show live. Remember, this podcast comes out. You can find it, Be Heard Talk, on Black Enterprises uh, website and, and, and social media platforms as well. And also, please continue to support our effort on patreon.com slash Be Heard Talk by supporting us. We will continue to support the issues and causes that you care about. Until next Sunday, guys, have a good one. Peace. Bye.